if you have your Bibles this morning, turn with me, if you can, to the book of Exodus, chapter 5. Exodus chapter 5, and I believe that the Lord has laid a word on my heart for the child of God today. Exodus chapter 5, we'll begin reading at verse number 4. And the word of God says, And the king of Egypt said unto them, Wherefore do ye, Moses and Aaron, let or hinder the people from their works? Get you unto your burdens. And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land now are many, and you make them rest from their burdens. And Pharaoh commanded the same day the taskmasters of the people and their officers, saying, You shall no more give the people straw to make brick as heretofore. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. And the tale of the bricks, or the number of the bricks that they did make heretofore, you shall lay upon them. You shall not diminish aught thereof, for they be idle. Therefore they cry, saying, Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Verse 9. Let their more work be laid upon the men, that they may labor therein, and let them not regard vain words. And the taskmasters of the people went out and their officers, and they spake to the people, saying, Thus saith Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go ye, get you straw where you can find it, yet not all of your work shall be diminished. And I want you to look at verse 12 with me very closely this morning. So the people were scattered abroad throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble instead of of straw. And I want to use for a subject this morning, just for the next few minutes, bricks without straw. Bricks without straw. And what I believe the Lord has laid upon my heart to tell you this morning, that if there's anybody here that you know you're saved beyond the shadow of a doubt, but there's still a bondage of sin, there is still a bondage of the powers of darkness in your life. I believe that today is going to be the day when the chains are broken. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. And if you will hear the words of the Holy Spirit this morning, not only will you find the way of victory, but you'll be able to walk in it. You'll be able to not just get the victory, but you'll be able to keep the victory. And if there's anybody watching over the internet this morning, you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you are born again and you love God with all of your heart, but yet you are still struggling with bondages of sin within your life. Jesus Christ is here to set you free this morning. Amen. Bricks without straw. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Dear God, we thank you for your presence that we have sensed, that we've experienced in this house. Lord, we thank you for the souls that are going to say yes to Jesus and have said yes to Jesus as a result of your, the moving of your spirit here this morning. Lord, as we minister your word this morning, we realize that within ourselves, we can speak nothing. We can do nothing. We can be nothing. Lord, but I pray that for the next few moments this morning, that you would make my tongue as the pen of a ready writer. Lord, there is nothing that I can say out of my own mind or out of my own flesh that will be able to help your people. But Lord, if my tongue is touched by the power of the Holy Spirit, you will speak words of life, of power, and of deliverance to your people this morning. Guide my thoughts, guide my words, guide the direction of the remainder of this service, and anoint your people this morning under the sound of our voice, whether here or over the internet this morning. Lord, let freedom come to the soul that is bound, and we ask it in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. And Amen. We begin our Story this morning with Israel in Egyptian bondage. And we all know the story about how they came to be in bondage. We remember back from the book of Genesis how the story of Joseph went. Amen. How that he was sold by his jealous brethren into Egyptian bondage. But God was with Joseph. 
and he raised him up despite being thrown into the prison, despite being a servant in the house of Potiphar, the Lord exalted Joseph and made him the most powerful man in the world outside of Pharaoh himself. And the Lord used Joseph. See, whatever the devil plans for evil in our lives, God, the Holy Spirit, can override the powers of darkness and he can turn any situation around for our benefit because the Word of God still says, well, for all things work out for the good to them who love God and are the called according to his purpose. No matter what situation we find ourselves in, if we will not let go of the hand of Jesus Christ, He will bring us over every bondage. He will bring us over every negative circumstance. And if we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, He will exalt us in due time. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And God used Joseph's situation to save many lives because, as you know, there was a famine that hit that area of the world. And God really used Joseph in that position, not just to save lives, but to bring Jacob, yes. who was a type of Israel as a nation, back into fellowship. And all that was a type, I'm not really preaching on this this morning, but that was a type of one day when Jesus comes to earth again. And all the sons of Jacob, the nation of Israel, are gathered finally after 2,000 years of wandering to the Lord Jesus Christ. We all know the story of Joseph. But as we open the book of Exodus, the word of God tells us, now there arose up a new king over Egypt who knew not Joseph, meaning he had no respect for Joseph. He did not recognize Joseph's rightful authority. And instead of giving the children of Israel privileges as they have had in the land of Goshen up until this point, the word of God tells us that this new king caused Israel to serve with rigor and with hard bondage. Now, many have taken this story that we've started with this morning and leading up to Israel's deliverance out of Egypt as a portrayal of the salvation experience, and that's true. Well, all of us used to be bound in the world, bound by the powers of darkness, and it was Jesus who set us free and made us his peculiar people. But really, if we are to take a closer look at the truest interpretation of the scripture here. Israel in bondage already belonged to Jehovah. Come on, did you hear me? When Moses and Aaron appeared before Pharaoh, they didn't say, let this people go. But God, the Holy Ghost, gave them the commandment to say unto Pharaoh, let my people go that they may serve me. So this isn't really a portrayal in the truest sense of a salvation experience, even though that can apply. Truly, it is a portrayal of sanctification, a picture of the people of God being held in bondage, even though they already belong to Christ, being held in bondage by the power of the enemy. Now, just as Israel was in bondage, even though they already belonged to God, many believers in the church today are in a similar state of bondage. I want you to understand what we're saying. There are believers who are struggling with sin in some way, shape, or form in their life. And I want to say at the very outset this morning that it is not the will of God for sin to have dominion over the life of the believer. Amen. The word of God says, for sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under the law, but you're under grace. Hallelujah. These are people that truly are born again. They truly belong to God, and they can correctly be called the people of God, but yet they are still in bondage to sin. You may have made vow after vow after vow to God, saying, I'll never do it again, but yet every single time, no matter how much you fight, no matter how much you try not to sin or let that thing have dominion over over your life, every single time you fall back into it. And let me say this this morning, you are not a hypocrite for struggling with the sin nature. You are no hypocrite 
Many times the devil will lie to us and say, if you still have a bondage of sin in your life, that you really don't belong to Jesus at all, that you're just a hypocrite, that you should just wash your hands of the whole deal and quit. But you're not a hypocrite. You watching over the internet, you love Jesus. You've been washed in his blood. You belong to him. You here in the sanctuary, if it applies to anybody here, you belong to Jesus, and he is your Lord and your Savior, but you're still in bondage to sin. And you're still in bondage to the powers of darkness. Why is that? Why are most Christians still in that position of slavery to sin? It's because they do not have a proper understanding of the cross of Christ regarding the sanctification of the believer. Did you hear me? You watching... Over the internet, you here in the sanctuary, have you ever had anybody tell you how to have lasting victory over sin? Have you ever? Hasn't anybody ever told you that the same way that you got saved, which was how? By faith in Jesus and what he did at the cross of Calvary is the same way that you not only stay saved, but that you experience victory over the powers of darkness, how you grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, how you progress in your walk with God. It all comes through the same means, and it is Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, I want you to understand this morning, if you do not have a proper understanding of the message of the cross for sanctification and thereby place your faith exclusively in Christ and what he did for you at the cross in one way or another, you will be led into bondage. It's quiet in here. If you don't understand the role that the cross plays, and that's what we're here to tell you this morning. If you don't understand the role that the cross plays in your deliverance, if you don't understand the role that the blood of Jesus plays in your overcoming Christian life 24-7, let let this poor preacher begin to tell you about it this morning. I got to say it this way. It's either the cross or it's bondage. It's either the cross or it's the dominion of sin. It's either the blood of Jesus or the powers of darkness will have the dominion over your life. Only the blood of Jesus can break the chains of darkness. Only the blood of Jesus. That was the entire reason that the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Galatians. You understand that? People that were turning away from the cross and going back into man-made law. And we're going to get into it here in just a minute this morning. But he told them in Galatians 5 and 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty, the freedom, wherewith Christ has made you free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. I'm here to tell you this morning that if you don't understand the cross for sanctification, you will be led back. Back into bondage again. I can't make that any clearer today. I don't know any other way to say it other than that way. You either have your faith exclusively in Christ and Him crucified, or the sin nature is going to rule your life. There's no shortcuts around this. There's no ifs, ands, or buts to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's either the cross or it's death. It's either the cross or it's bondage. And this lack of understanding about the cross, and I'm not meaning to demean anybody when I say that, but there, there's some things that sometimes we just don't know. Sometimes there's things that nobody's ever told us. But this is the reason why we have so many Christians in the body of Christ still struggling with alcohol still struggling with drugs, still struggling with pornography, still struggling with lust. And again, I don't mean to demean anybody that may be listening to me this morning, but I'm just trying to be truthful. Let's be realistic about it this morning. That's why. That no matter how hard you fight, you still, at the end of the day, when you sit in front of your television set, that you still reach for that can of beer. You love Jesus. He's your Lord. He's your Savior. But you can't stop the urge to drink that alcohol. 
You can't stop clicking on those websites that show you pornography. You can't stop tipping the pill bottle no matter how hard you try. But I want to tell you this morning that bondage does not just apply to the vices. It's very easy for us to understand a, a, a problem with alcohol or a problem with drugs or illicit sex or anything that we can mention. But the greatest bondage of all is the bondage of religion. Yes. That's it. Did you understand what I just said? The greatest bondage that the devil can ensnare a Christian in is the bondage of religion. You can be born again, truly bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, and still be enslaved by religion. Now, what do I mean by religion? I mean it's a system of works that you make up yourself, or that a preacher tells you to do, or a church tells you to do, or the latest New York Times best-selling book to hit the market tells you what to do. You are trying to bring about holiness, sanctification, and deliverance by what you do within your own strength. You don't believe Christians are doing it this morning? I'll give you just a few examples. 40 days. Follow my regimen. Follow this 21 days of fasting regimen. Buy my book. Listen to my sermon package, but leave an offering of $99.95 at the bottom of the page, and you'll be free. We laugh, but this is serious business because we're messing with the souls of God's people. And it's crude, but I got to say it this way. There are stupid preachers and stupid denominations and stupid pastors and stupid church leaders that are telling their people if you're having a problem with sin you need to join the closest 12-step program to where you live if you're having a problem with alcohol then the answer for your life will be found in going to Alcoholics Anonymous I'm here to tell you this morning that if you as a child of God ever entrust your salvation or your sanctification to the ways of this world and the ways of man, you are setting yourself up for destruction because man cannot set free man. Only Jesus Christ, by the power of what he did at Calvary, can set you free. This is the greatest way that Satan keeps people bound. He takes advantage of their ignorance regarding the cross. Did you hear what I said? The devil doesn't play fair. The devil doesn't play by the rules. Oh, they don't understand the cross, so I better not step on their toes. I better not draw them off in a false direction. No, the devil that we are against this morning, the powers of darkness that are arrayed against you as a child of God, they play dirty. They are out for keeps. They are out to do nothing but to steal, kill, and destroy. And even though you may not understand the message of the cross, and it's our prayer that you will understand, if you don't yet, by the end of this service, He will take advantage of your ignorance regarding the cross, and He drags believers into captivity to the doing of religion. It's the idea that we can effect our own deliverance and set ourselves free according to what we do. And listen here, this is going to step on some toes. I've already got mine curled underneath, so I can't step on my own. But the reason that we fall for it, and I put myself at the head of the line because I'm just as susceptible as you are to fall for the lies of the enemy if I don't trust Jesus Christ. The reason that we fall for all of these schemes is because each of us have enough pride in our heart as a result of the fall that thinks that we can contribute something toward our sanctification. Uh Uh-oh. There's enough pride on the heart, inside the heart of every single person on the face of this earth as a result of the fall. And what is the middle letter in the word pride? The middle letter is I. It's about me. It's about my works. 
It's about what I do. It's about my church attendance. It's about my fasting regimen. It's about my 21 days of this and 40 days of that. Don't you know the only reason that Jesus exists is to glorify me? Is that not the thought in most churches today? When you got people standing up behind their pulpit and say, when you go to church, it's not so much for the Lord. You come to church for yourself. There's a problem. There's a problem. Have people said that? Yes, they have. On worldwide platforms. Now, talking about the bondage of religion. Pharaoh had the Israelites in the scriptures that we read this morning trying to make bricks without straw. Bricks without straw. He was trying to to have them accomplish something that they had no power to do. You can't make bricks without straw. You can't make bricks without straw. They were trying to produce something without having the necessary ingredients to get the job done. And that's where the devil has most believers. Remember, the children of Israel, they are God's people. They belong to Jehovah. But yet, Pharaoh, who is a type of Satan, a symbol of Satan, has the people of God in bondage trying to produce something without having the power to do it. We do not have the power or the ingredients, spiritually speaking, within the flesh in order to overcome any bondage of darkness. My, it's quiet in here. I'm getting nervous. I must be preaching to everybody this morning. I'm preaching to me. But how many of us can say it's like we're on a spiritual treadmill? You love Jesus with all of your heart. You want to serve him. And that's the surefire way to know that you are born again. That the desire to do the will of God is down on the inside of your spirit and your soul and your deep recesses of your person. But you're going about it through what you do. You're going about it through what the, the, the latest fad of the church tells you to do. And you feel like you're on a spiritual treadmill. What are you talking about? You're expending all of your energy. You're working, you're putting your blood, sweat, and tears into trying to bring about victory through what you do. And all you're doing is wearing yourself out and you're not getting anywhere. It's all bricks without straw. That's what the Holy Spirit says about the 40 days of purpose. It's bricks without straw. That's what the Holy Spirit says about the Daniel fast or any of these other things that men try to use to have victory over sin. It's bricks without straw. You're trying to do something that you within yourself don't have the power to accomplish. Now let me submit this to you this morning. If there was anything that we could personally do to bring about freedom from sin, Jesus could have stayed in heaven. There would have been no need whatsoever for him to come down and pay the price at Calvary. He could have stayed on his throne in heaven and said, just fast for 21 days. He could have said, just follow this 40-day regimen. Well, let me ask you a question. Those somebody that may be watching over the internet this morning that may be following that, what are you going to do when you get to day 41? It's 40 days of purpose. Well, if you don't get the victory after day 40, where are you going to go? Paul said it in Galatians 2 and 21. If righteousness or victory, you could say, comes by the law, meaning what you do through your own effort, through your own willpower, your own works, if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. That Jesus died needlessly. That Jesus died without purpose. 
But we should know by looking at the price that was paid for sin and how awful it was and what a tall price that Jesus had to pay at the cross, not only to save us, but to release us from the powers of darkness. Just by looking at that, we ought to know that anything that we come up with is nothing but bricks without straw. It's nothing. It has no power. It took the shedding of the blood of the lamb in order to bring about the victory that we need. Paul said in Romans chapter 8, for what the law could not do, not just the law of Moses, not just the Ten Commandments, but any law that is passed down from man's wisdom or by your church leadership, or by your denomination, or by the New York Times best-selling books that you're buying by the hundreds of dollars. What the law could not do, in that it was what? It was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the weakness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. What the law could not do. What our works could not do. What our regimens could not do. Jesus did it on our behalf 2,000 years ago. Why don't we turn to Romans chapter 8 this morning for just a minute. Romans chapter, I know I'm, try, I'm not trying to get ahead of the pastor. He'll hit this, the, take, take two when he gets to it in his series. But start reading at verse number 7 this morning. It says, For the carnal mind, that mind which is trying to do something through its own energy, through its own works, is enmity or animosity or hatred against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. And look at verse 8. I want you to hear it this morning. Everywhere where my voice is going. So then they that are in the flesh cannot. It says cannot. I said cannot. Please God. They that are in the flesh. They that are trying to work to get free. You cannot please God. Verse 9. But you are not in the flesh meaning those that truly have their faith in the cross. You are not in the flesh, but you are in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And look at verse 10. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. You could say it this way in the Greek. The body is dead because of the presence of the sin nature. See, that's your problem this morning. You here in the sanctuary, that's your problem. The sin nature. That's your problem. Your problem if you're struggling with sin is not that you're a hypocrite. It's not that you're just playing church, even though some people definitely do. It's not that you have a demon spirit and you have to have it cast out. If you're struggling with gambling or whatever the case, your problem is the sin nature that dwells on the inside of us as a result of the fall. And Jesus made us free from the sin nature at Calvary. And when we place our faith in what Jesus has already accomplished for us at the cross, Paul told us in the sixth chapter that we are baptized into his death. That we are buried with him by baptism into death. And our association, our union with Jesus in his death at the cross severed our relationship with the power of the sin nature. And just as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. It is not God's will for the sin nature to dominate you any longer. It's not the will of God for you to be bound by the powers of darkness. It's His will that you experience new life. It's His will, as Marty said it this morning, to experience life more abundantly. The resurrection power. 
power of the Lord Jesus Christ. But you can only have that resurrection power as long as you understand that our victory was purchased through his death at Calvary. Because Paul said it in Romans 6 and 5, if we have been planted together with him in the likeness of his death, we shall be also. No questions. No strings left attached. If we are in the likeness of his death, we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Glory to God. The body is dead. Eight and ten, please. If Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. Because of the presence, because of the power of the sin nature, it has rendered the human being totally powerless to produce anything that God can accept or use. But, and if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but here we go. The spirit is life. Because of righteousness, Romans chapter 8 and verse 10. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Look at 8 and verse 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Christ from the dead dwell in you, and he does, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Hallelujah. That's your answer. The power of the Holy Spirit will give you not just the will, but he will give you the how to do the will of God. Not only will he give you the, 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 the will, but he will give you the power to do of God's Good pleasure. And the work of the Holy Spirit is is predicated on our faith in Jesus. And what Jesus did at the cross. I got to hurry this morning. Verse 12. Where therefore, brethren, we are debtors. But notice what it says. We are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. We as believers are to reckon the flesh as something that has already been crucified. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. For if you live after the flesh, verse 13, for if you live after the flesh, if you keep trying to do it through your own strength, what's going to happen? You shall die. That's pretty cut and plain, isn't it? You shall die. Meaning you will not have the victory that you seek because the answer that you seek is found in the cross. The solution which you seek is found in the cross. The answer for which you seek is found only in the cross. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, that's us reckoning us to be dead to sin, dead to the power of the flesh, you shall live. Hallelujah. So the Lord hasn't called you. No matter what the problem is, the Lord has not called you to struggle with that thing anymore. He has made every provision within the power of heaven that you might be free. All you have to do is lay it down at the foot of the cross. All you have to do is realize that Jesus has already won every victory over your life that you need. It's not a matter of you trying to bring it about. It's already been done. There's no more work required. Just believe. Now, there's something else I need to address here very quickly. Some of you may be saying, Brother Jeremy, I've heard what all of you at this church have been saying about the cross. I've heard it. I believe it. I've placed my faith in what Jesus has done there for me, just like you've said. But I haven't seen the victory yet. There's still some land in your life, spiritually speaking, where sin still has dominion. I haven't seen the victory yet. And not only have I not seen the victory, in fact, my situation has become worse. The bondage seems to be getting stronger than ever. You tell me that the answer is found in the cross. Why is the problem getting worse instead of better? Well, praise God, the scripture today has an answer for you too. Hallelujah. The reason Israel found themselves in this position of making bricks without straw 
is because of what the Lord told Pharaoh at the beginning of chapter 5 that we read out of this morning. When Moses and Aaron went in before Pharaoh and he said, let my people go that they may serve me. In Exodus chapter 5 and verse 3, the request was, let us go, we pray you, three days journey into the desert and sacrifice unto the Lord our God. You notice that. Let us go three days journey into the desert and sacrifice unto the Lord our God. It was at the mention of sacrifice. It was at the mention of, if you will, the cross that Pharaoh turned up the pressure. That it was Pharaoh's intention to turn up the pressure and increase their workload as a result of them wanting to go to the cross in symbolic form. That the, it was his intention that the increased workload and servitude would cause them to grow weary and give up any dream whatsoever of being free from Egypt. He said in verse 9, let there be more work. We read it this morning. Let there be more work laid upon the men that they may labor therein and let them not regard vain words. Did you hear that? Fair, because of the mention of sacrifice, because of the mention of the cross, you may have heard the message of the cross. You believe the message of the cross. Your faith is in the blood of Jesus alone, but yet the pressure is being turned up in your life and it seems like the bondage is going stronger. It's because Satan has, has, has realized that you have found the answer. Come on. The reason that the pressure is being turned up is, and the reason that Satan has been fighting you so hard is because he knows that when you place your faith exclusively in Jesus Christ and him crucified, that, that you have found the answer and that he's going to have to let you go. Amen. You understand? Hallelujah. See the cross, the victory of the cross was done in the face of the entire universe. When Jesus died and shed his blood and said, it is finished, there was no question as to whether he won the battle or not. The Bible tells us that at the cross, through the victory that he won there, that he spoiled principalities and powers. In other words, he stripped them of all of their authority. He took away all legal claim that Satan has over your life in order to hold you in bondage. And if you will get a hold of that truth, and if you will walk in that truth, if you will build your life upon the truth of the cross, that's why Satan fights you so hard. Because he knows that it was at the cross that he was defeated. The cross de dealt a death blow to Satan and all the powers of darkness. And as I said, it took away all of his authority to hold you in captivity. And he has to let you go. He has no choice. But he will not give up his ground easily. Now, in some of us, you each know your own heart. The Lord knows all of our hearts. There may be some things in our lives that we've been struggling with for 20, 30 40, 50 plus years that we just can't seem to get over it. That's land that Satan has held in your life for literal decades with some of us. He doesn't relinquish his authority easily. At the first mention of the cross, he doesn't just tuck tail and run. We said earlier that Satan doesn't play fair. He doesn't give up easy either. Moses and Aaron, if you read through the book of Exodus, they had to go before Pharaoh seven times with the commandment from God, let my people go. You notice that the first time that they went into his throne room and said, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, let my people go. Do you notice that he didn't let them go the first time? But instead he hardened his heart against the commandment of God and refuse to let Israel go, Moses and Aaron had to come before him seven times before God had visited Pharaoh's kingdom with such severe judgment that Pharaoh literally had no choice. It was either he lets the Hebrews go 
or his country, his nation, becomes an ash heap. Do you understand that? Pharaoh's kingdom was hit by frogs. Pharaoh's kingdom was hit by lice. The rivers of Egypt were turned to blood where the people couldn't drink of the water of the river. They were smitten with locusts. There was darkness around the land of Egypt. There was a feverish blister that broke out all over the people of Egypt. And the firstborn, all the way from Pharaoh's son, all the way down, were dead in a moment's time because the angel of death went through the streets. If Pharaoh didn't let them go, there wasn't going to be an Egypt left. And not only did he say, you can go, the scripture says he thrust them out. Get out of here. Take all the gold you want. Take all the nice fancy clothes that you want. Take all the jewels that you want. I don't care. Just take whatever you want. Just get out of here. Because if you are here one minute more, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to have a nation left to rule over. It doesn't matter how many times that you have to say to Satan, thus saith the Lord God of blank, put your name in it. Thus saith the Lord God of Marty. Thus saith the Lord God of Doris. Thus saith the Lord God of Mike and Tammy. Let my people go. It doesn't matter how many times you have to tell Satan that he must let you go because of what Jesus did at the cross. Even if it takes you seven times. Even if it takes you 70 times, seven times. Don't quit. Don't give up. Because eventually... If you don't turn away from the right way, if you don't turn away from the way of the cross, the devil will have to let you go and you will be free by the power of Almighty God. Worship team, come on back up here. Hallelujah. Praise God. I want to close with this. We come now to the night of Israel's deliverance. They come before Pharaoh seven times. Let my people go, saith the Lord God of Israel. Pharaoh's in a position that he has no choice but to let them go. What did the Lord tell them to do? He said, take a lamb. A lamb for every house. Inspect it. Make sure there's no blemish. Make sure there's no spot. Make sure there's no imperfection. Kill it. Take the blood. Strike it on the cross beam of your door and on the two side posts. And everybody go on the inside of the house and partake of the lamb. And when the angel of death passes through the streets, whenever he comes to a door where the blood has been applied, he said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Now notice, following up with what we've been saying this morning, that he didn't say, when I see your church, when I see your nice suit of clothes, when I see your works, when I see your denomination, when I see all that you have tried to do through your flesh. But what did the Lord say? When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And that night, the Lord wrought a great victory over the nation of Egypt. All those that had oppressed his people. And by the blood of the Lamb, Israel was set free. Amen. And they belonged exclusively to Jehovah. And all the powers of darkness were broken. Hallelujah. Now, as I said a few moments ago, I don't know the situation of your life. I don't know what you may be struggling with this morning, both here and over the live stream. But you know, and the Holy Spirit knows. And if we could all stand this morning for just a moment. Those of us, if you can stand, please stand. You might say, Brother Jeremy, I've been struggling with this thing for so many years. I'm almost at the point of quitting. Don't quit. But with every head bowed and every eye closed this morning, 
If you have a bondage within your life, now you don't have to tell us what it is because it's none of our business. I don't want you to know my dirt and I don't want to know yours. But if, there's a, if you're here this morning and you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you are saved and you belong to Jesus Christ, but yet there's still a bondage in your life that you can't seem to get victory over, bring it to the cross today. The Lord hasn't called us to struggle with it. The Lord hasn't called us to fight against sin. The Lord has called us to only do one thing, believe. To fight the good fight of faith. That no matter what hell may throw at us, no matter what the devil may try, that no matter how hard we may have to fight to keep our faith where it ought to be, that we will keep our faith in what Jesus did at Calvary. If that applies to you this morning, I don't want us to be embarrassed. I'm not trying to make a spectacle out of anybody because if the truth be told, every single one of us need to respond to this in one way or the other. We're going to pray with you. We're going to pray for you because every single person in this house and every single person watching, you need the Holy Spirit to make you free from something. Whether it's jealousy, whether it's bitterness, whether it's unforgiveness, whether it's a prideful look, whether it's you are have feet that are swift to shed innocent blood, you need to have the Holy Spirit set you free of something. And I want to open up these altars for just a few minutes this morning. If you have a bondage in your life and you still need freedom, I want you to come this morning. Don't worry about what anybody else is going to think about you. The only thing that matters is your relationship with God. The only thing, there is nothing more important than you being free to serve Jesus Christ without any hindrance, without any bondage. I want you to come this morning. I want you to lay it down at the foot of the cross. I want you to spend a few minutes alone with Jesus. And I want you to give it to him. Lay down the struggle. Come unto me, Jesus says, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Amen. Let's sing.